talk to them for two or three days based upon some idea that this case is complex. They've heard the evidence. You've said so many times, Your Honor, these are smart people. They've heard the evidence. Uh, certainly, we hope they've kept an open mind. But they know what they feel about all these witnesses at this point. Uh, I think some of your recent rulings have tried to tell us enough already. Uh, and that's really the theme that we picked up here from you and from the jury. It seems that everybody understands that except the prosecution. And so toward that end, we've said, given this case, given all of our experience in trying cases, we believe that we should be able to concise our arguments, even with videotape, into one full day, both sides. Where if Ms. Clark starts to argue on Tuesday, she has from 9 until 5 or whatever hours you said. If, uh, if we start to argue on uh, Wednesday, uh, we have a like amount of time. In fact, I think what we really are saying is that she has perhaps a little bit less than we do because in the total of her argument, it's going to come to the same amount. In other words, she wouldn't have all day Thursday to try and rebut what we do on Wednesday. That would be unfair. I think we'd all agree. But at any rate, what I'm concerned about is that she gets up and tries to argue for like two and a half days. And then let's assume that she does that. Let's assume that they're unwise enough to try to argue for two and a half days next week. We would then be to Thursday afternoon. You're going to be dark on Friday and Monday. What are we to do? Uh, start my argument on Thursday afternoon and then come back on Tuesday? I want to tell you, I had that experience in an opening statement. That's not fair to Mr. Simpson or to the uh, jurors. And so I that think might, that might be ideal timing for you because you could leave them with the last thought over a long weekend. Well, if I thought I could finish it in a half day, that might be ideal timing. But I think, Your Honor, I need, we need a little more than a half day. So what I'm asking really is just some fundamental fairness at the end. And I'm, using, I'm asking you to do what you've done uh, so very often in this case, is use your discretion. This is an area of discretion. You want to protect these jurors, and that's all we're saying. We're not trying to dictate anything anybody does. Because in the final analysis, we have to use our own good judgment. Uh, and I think Ms. Clark will do that also. But it seems to me, as, as very often in this case, we need some guidelines to help us use our good judgment. And all I want is fairness. Uh, you know her rebuttal argument is limited to rebut what we have. So if you give us a finite amount of time, if we have six hours and she uses five and a half, then she's going to be left with only a half hour at the end. So uh, I, think, I think that's the way it should be carved out. Um, and I think that's fair to everybody. I, I just venture to guess, if you submitted this to the jurors, they probably asked for less than a day of argument, if it was left up to them. And so I think we have to have them in mind. After all, this is supposedly for them to tie this case together. We welcome this opportunity, but I think we have to make the most of the opportunity. And in order to make the most of the opportunity, it seems to me we do it in a concise, cogent, persuasive fashion so these people get the message. And that's all I'm really asking. And so specifically, we ask that the arguments be limited to, limited to one day per side, that we understand what's going to happen, and we get this case to the jury by the end of Thursday, uh, September 28th, 1995, this case goes to that jury. And we want to be part of that, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Your Honor. We filed a brief with the court in response to this request, and I found it interesting to note that there was case law uh, in the area. I didn't think there would be. People versus Green, it's almost 100 years old. But it has been a recognized principle for over 100 years that the length of argument has to be governed by the length and complexity of the case. As the court has seen, this is a very complex case, made more so by the manner in which it's been tried. It's a physical evidence case. This court knows very well the complexities of a circumstantial evidence premised on, circumstan on physical evidence. We have had enormous amounts of scientific testimony. We have had testimony from a number of experts on each area of physical evidence, blood, hair, fiber, uh, as well as the coroner. It's been extensive. If it was the intent of the defense to get this case quickly to the jury, then the defense did not have to spend almost a week talking to the jury through their expert about the movement of an envelope a few inches because the coroner moved the body. If the defense wanted to limit the time that it took this case to get to the jury, it did not have to question Detective Lang for eight days on cross-examination. If the defense wanted to limit the time it took to get this case to the jury, it did not have to question Dennis Fung for nine days. 
as the court has seen repeatedly, our witnesses have been subjected to the most thorough, blistering cross-examination I have ever seen in 17 years of practice. It has been lengthy, it has been detailed, and I'm so, I suppose reasonable minds can differ as to whether or not it's been overdone. Be that as it may, many, many issues were raised. We bear the burden of proof. It is very clear that the reason for the defense wanting to limit closing argument is to gain what they perceive to be a tactical advantage. I understand the tactical advantage that they want to achieve here. The defense says that they can tie their case together in just a few hours or maybe a day. That's because they have very little to tie together, Your Honor. This was not a thematic defense <laughs> in terms of evidence. I it see you're arguing already. Elizabeth. Yes. Well, <laughs> it is an argument, Your Honor. <laughs> argument about an argument. Only in this case. Only in this case. It's true. I think. No, I mean, it's not, it, that's not true. I mean, in other cases, I, I've talked to other judges, a uh, judge who handled the Night Stalker case, judge who handled the Martin case, judge who handled the uh, Denny case, and we've all discussed whether or not it's an appropriate exercise of the court's discretion to limit argument. So your basic argument is it's not fair because it's our burden of proof and we have a lot of stuff to prove. Yeah, yeah. that's right. We're the ones that have a lot to tie together. We're the ones that have literally mountains of evidence to weave together with the testimony of lay witnesses concerning motive and opportunity to present as a cohesive fabric to this jury. But isn't it a very powerful argument that the defense makes that this court should do everything it possibly can to encourage counsel to be precise and concise in their argument, and that a time limit would cause both sides to evaluate what it is that's important in this case and what isn't, what the big picture is, and not get lost in the, the minutia of 12 days of argument. I agree with you, Your Honor. I don't think, I don't think the court needs to worry that the people are going to get lost in minutia. Uh, we're, you, you can, we're professionals. We don't attempt this at home. We would be able to we are going to make every effort to be as concise as we can. We know that the, we know that the jury is tired. We know they don't want to hear a lot of words. We know that the best thing to do is get it to them as quickly as we can. All right, Ms. Clark, taking into consideration the length of the trial, the complexity of the case, the number of witnesses that you've called, um, the burden of proof, what do you think is a reasonable amount of time for the prosecution for opening and closing arguments? How can I possibly estimate that, not knowing what the defense is going to do or how long the defense will take, well, what they'll go into? I what do you can't. think? What do you think your opening argument is going to be? How long will it take? Yes. I think I can't. You know, Your Honor, it's, it's unfair at this point. We have not, as the court knows, there's going to be graphics. Mm -hmm. You know, there's well, going to be. Part, I can't. Know, let me let me put it to you this way. You know, we discussed at the very beginning of this case limitations on the number of, of counsel who will argue and that the court was contemplating a limitation on the arguments. So um, you should have some rough idea of how long you believe it's going to take. Very rough. I don't know. I don't know. The opening portion of the people's case would probably take roughly two days. And I don't think that's a long, long time considering the amount of evidence we have here, a circumstantial evidence case. The problem that I really have is estimating the amount of time on rebuttal. I mean, you're asking me to estimate in a blind. I don't know what they're going to do. No, that's why I, I confine my asking you to estimate to your opening argument. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a very rough estimate without having paced through it with the exhibits and laser boards. And I, I assume that uh, your uh, colleagues will assist you in marshalling all the exhibits. And I've, uh, I've indicated uh, to you that uh, my staff will be available to both sides to uh, organize. I mean, we've, we've prepared Mrs. Robertson's list of uh, exhibits, and we will do everything we can. All of my uh, law clerks will be standing in the wings with exhibits, you ask for the exhibit and it'll be produced. And I appreciate that, Your Honor. That will be very, very helpful to us. But a large part of the presentation will involve graphic displays that will not involve the court's 
cooperation, um, although we do accept it uh, as the very gracious offer that it is. I would also indicate to the court that the real, I think, intent of the defense motion is to limit the rebuttal by the people. What they'd like to see is their, their case, their presentation, not attacked as thoroughly as it can be and will be. And that's the limitation they really seek. And that's what would be so unfair. I've never, had a, I've never tried a case where the, the court has imposed a time limit. And I'm not saying that that's precedent for anything. All I'm saying is that I have never, over lengthy arguments have not been my problem with juries. Um, and I don't intend to break that habit now, given the fact that the jury is tired and we don't want to tax them more than we already have. I, I think that the court can trust me when I say absolutely that there is going to, we will trim our sails and be as tight and concise as we can possibly be. But to impose a time limit in a case that has already gone this long with this much evidence produces an unfair burden only to the people. This is a, this is a motion that is punitive really only to the people. The defense can get up, raise questions, confuse evidence, misstate testimony that quick. And in a case of this complexity, it's easy to do, create the confusion and the distortion. It takes something for the people to unravel it and put it back together and put things in their proper context for the jury and to limit our ability to do so is nothing less than limiting the people's right to a fair trial, limiting our ability to explain to the jury how the evidence has overwhelmingly proven the defendant's guilt. And there can be no justice in that. In what the people propose, we don't propose to limit the defense argument. We propose that the defense take as long as they think they need for their argument. And let me remind the court that the people's opening statement was shorter than the defendant's, even when you put it all together and you take out the delays. So we have precedent here for the manner in which the people present their case. And all I'm asking from the court at this final 11th hour is please give us the chance to pull it together for the jury. After all of the obstacles that have been put in our way with things that we could never have anticipated, we need the opportunity to explain this to the jury in an unfettered manner and to be trusted as professionals that we are, that we will not abuse the jury's patience too much. Good afternoon again, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be personal and talk about mis misleading and distorting and all that stuff. You know, I want to elevate the discussion. You know, this is not about one side or the other. This is about this search for truth, Judge. And you know, as we said before, uh, the, the Ms. Ms. Clark stands before you and says, you know, trust us. Uh, we're going to get this case over with uh, real quickly. They're the same people who trust us, and they took eight months to put their case on. You know, they talk about eight months, we had eight weeks, and they're talking about our cross-examination. So, Judge, you know, you can trust us all you want. I'm saying trust us, but give us some direction and some guidance. That's why you're the judge, and you have not been bashful about doing that. One thing I'm concerned about, Ms. Clark kept talking about graphics. We haven't seen any graphics. Uh, I think there must be some, <laughs> the, the real reason I'm back up here is we want to see their graphics, obviously, as early as possible before they start, because the, we, we're entitled to do that, and she's talking about displays and various things. When are we going to see those? And so I hope the court will take care of that. Let, let me get to, the, to her response. Um, you know, there are complex cases. The World Trade Center case, the judge in that case is giving the lawyers a time limit, four hours. We have this all the time. Judges give you, say, counsel, you have four hours to finish your argument. You have two hours. You have one day. I mean, this is not unusual at all. Lawyers don't stand up before you and say, please don't do this to us, Your Honor, the people are being punished. Lawyers deal with what they're dealt with. When you rule this morning, you didn't see us crying. We just moved on to the next issue. We don't do that. That's what a professional does. You move forward. Most of the time. Well, 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 sometimes. Well, one time we did cry, Your Honor. I have to admit, there was one ruling that made us cry a little bit. But short of that, you'll have to admit, throughout this, this whole trial, we have usually moved forward um, in the water like a shark. And that's, that's what we want to do. That's uh, a bad analogy. Well, not a good analogy. A shark a shark's probably not a good analogy. We moved forward in the water like a dolphin. Graceful, I hope, if that's better. But, but uh, seriously, Judge, uh, we, we don't stand before you asking, you know, it's not a question of doing a favor for the prosecutor doing a favor for the defense. This is about 14 people who get $5 a day who've been here, Judge, since September 26th, 1994. I don't have to tell you that. Tuesday will be the first anniversary. They went, we went upstairs and met these people. We promised them certain things. And we're lawyers. We're professionals. Let's get this case over with. It's not any advantage we're trying to get. 
If she argues two days, I could argue four days. I feel so passionate about this case, I could argue from now on. I just have to concise it. This is not trying to shorten anything. She hasn't seen passion yet. I told them once before, they're in the fight for their lives, and now they understand that. And we're going to argue in that same vein next week. doesn't matter whether I argue one day or one week. They'll understand how we feel about this man's innocence. So it's not about time. I'm just asking you to step up, give us some rules. We'll abide by them. That's all I'm asking. And but for heaven's sakes, give us the, we want some time to see those graphics. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council, in, in contemplating um, limiting the argument here, I had to take into consideration a lot of things. First of all, the unique facts and circumstances of this particular case, the conduct of the lawyers and their argument to date, um, the length of time that this trial has gone on, and the increasingly limited endurance of our uh, jurors. Um, the court's experience, uh, I had to go outside my own experience to talk to other judges uh, to see what their experience has been and to hopefully gain some uh, wisdom from them. And in discussing the matter with uh, Judge Tynan, who tried the Night Stalker case, which went on for eight or nine months, uh, discussing the matter with uh, Judge Pounders, who tried the first Martin case, which went on for almost two years. Um, and if I recollect, collect, uh, recollect correctly, Judge Tynan's case involves 17 counts uh, of homicide. Um, highly complex issue, uh, issues involved in that case, and just pulling together all the evidence. And uh, my own experience as a trial lawyer, and I recollect one argument that went on for four days where the defendant was charged with five counts of murder in a circumstantial uh, evidence case. Um, but I also watched the jurors' eyes when I was arguing to them, and that's one of the great benefits of attorney arguments, is that the argument is to the jurors. And when you're arguing to the jurors, you look at them eyeball to eyeball, and you can tell when they're being receptive, hopefully, and you can tell when you're boring them or where you, when you've just said something that they don't believe. Uh, that's one of the great advantages of, uh, of argument. Um, I'm very concerned about maintaining control of this proceeding, especially at this point, given the limited endurance of our jury, and I am sorely tempted to impose a time limit, um, but I am not going to do so. And I'm going to trust the lawyers. But by ha having said that, um, I will come back to the start of this argument with probably three good nights of sleep. So I'll be on the top of my game as far as staying on top of the lawyers. And I will make sure that there is no redundancy and that we keep moving. And I will not hesitate to call you over to the sidebar and tell you to get moving or move on to something else. And I won't hesitate to do that also in front of the jury if I feel it's appropriate. So be prepared, be ready, be concise, knowing that um, I'm unusually tolerant of lawyers, but uh, this jury is going to have the last say. All right. That's another issue, Council. Okay. Could we, okay, I just, we another issue. Know, we need to know about that. And also, if, would I just, as a question of point of information, or if she, uh, Ms. Clark does take, let's say, two days, then there's a chance there will be a break in our argument. I understand that. We're, those, we're, we're setting concrete on the 29th. Unfortunately, we are. Okay. When I made those plans, I had no idea we'd still no, be no, here. I'm not actually changing plans. I just want to make sure that we need to a year later. Yeah, okay. Now those are plans that were made a year ago. All right, fifteen thirty-eight point five. We'll see them before they're used.
you see them uh, Friday afternoon here at 5 o'clock? Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock. Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock. And that's be the time to see them and project that sort of thing? This is the whole enchilada. Be here at 8 o'clock. Is that for everything? Snippets, boards, everything. everything. We have until Tuesday, 8 o'clock. Right. And that vacates the 5 o'clock Friday. Right? No, no. I want the transcript. I want the transcript notations. Okay. All right, Mr. Ullman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, the uh, defense would move to reopen the motion to suppress the evidence seized without a warrant uh, from Mr. Simpson's Rockingham residence on the morning of June 13th, uh, 1994, and uh, all of the fruits thereof, uh, so that this court can consider the testimony uh, received yesterday from Detective Van Adder, from Special Agent Wax, from Larry Fiato and Craig Fiato um, as relevant to the, the motion to suppress. Uh, this motion, of course, is based on the same grounds of uh, uh, newly discovered evidence that we asserted uh, with respect to the evidence related to the credibility of Detective Furman. Uh, I believe it raises essentially the same legal issues. Um, and we believe that the testimony that uh, Your Honor heard yesterday uh, was not only uh, relevant for the jury in assessing the credibility of Detective Van Adder with respect to the testimony they heard, uh, but of even greater relevance for this court to consider uh, in assessing the reasonableness of the entry to the premises uh, on the morning of June 13, 1994. Mr. Kelberg posed the question yesterday, what reason would Detective Van Adder have to lie about when O.J. Simpson became a suspect in this case? Uh, and the answer to that question goes back to the motion to suppress that was filed in this case in late June of 1994, um, a motion that created a need for a cover story uh, and a need to stick with that story throughout these proceedings. The first explanation that was ever given of the discovery of the glove uh, is found in the affidavit for a search warrant that Detective Van Adder executed um, in the uh, morning hours, sometime between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning, on June 13th, right after the glove had been discovered. And it's ironic that among all of the misrepresentations and untruths contained in that affidavit, there is one kernel of unvarnished truth. And that was the statement while securing the premises, the officers discovered a glove behind the Simpson residence. That the discovery took place uh, in the course of activity that involved the securing of a residence, uh, which suggests that they were engaged in a search at that very moment. And the initial issue we raised in the first motion to suppress, uh, simply based on the representation contained in that affidavit, uh, was that police are not entitled to secure premises uh, until they have probable cause to make a search. Uh, so it puts the cart before the horse for the police to say, while we were securing the premises, we found the evidence that we believe now gives us probable cause to get a search warrant to search the rest of the, of the residence. And that's what created the need to come up with another story, another explanation. Uh, and that was the first time we heard the explanation that, well, we really didn't go 
to the premises in order to look for a suspect or look for evidence. The only reason we went to those premises uh, was to notify Mr. Simpson of the death of his former wife and to make arrangements for the disposition of the children. That Mr. Simpson did not become a suspect until we found the glove. Now that's not to say that it, there was any legal necessity for them to deny that Mr. Simpson was a suspect. Legally, uh, if, if an officer has a subjective suspicion of a, of a suspect, that doesn't invalidate otherwise reasonably objective circumstances uh, that create the necessity for a, a warrantless entry. But the real crux of the relevance of this evidence with respect to the credibility of Detective Van Adder um, is the inconsistency that it creates in the entire explanation of what was going on that morning, of what the officers were really up to when they went over the wall and started looking around the premises of Mr. Simpson's home. Uh, and when you put the context of what they actually did against the alternative explanations. I mean, we have two alternative scenarios here. One is um, O.J. Simpson was not a suspect. We were only there to make a notification, to make arrangements for the children. And once we discovered that speck on the, on the door of the Bronco, to make sure there weren't other victims uh, on the premises or people who, who needed assistance versus the explanation of what's really going on here is a search. We're looking around for whatever we can find because we're, we want to solve this, uh, this murder. Uh, and the obvious suspect uh, right off the, 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 the bat, right, right off the beginning of, uh, of this whole process is O.J. Simpson. Uh, if you look at how they conducted themselves once they arrived at the premises, uh, it's much more consistent with the scenario of a search than it is the scenario of a, of a notification. The way they entered uh, uh, Mr. Kalin's room, searched the room, looked through his clothing, the way they questioned the, uh, the persons who were on the premises, the amount of time that they spent on the premises before the glove was even located, actually uh, uh, entering the premises uh, shortly after 5 a.m. and then finding the glove more than an hour later, uh, the, the uh, quickness with which they were able to ascertain uh, where Mr. Simpson was uh, and to actually uh, call him and speak to him and notify him. Uh, and the, the glove actually being found after that had occurred. Uh, the fact that they didn't even look upstairs. I mean, if, if their real concern was, we're looking for other victims. The fact that they didn't even go upstairs to see if there were any victims upstairs. All of this activity. But couldn't that also be argued that if it wasn't intended to be a generalized search for evidence, if they didn't even go upstairs? That's what the prosecution's going to do. Well, uh, question whether they, they, they possibly did go upstairs. Uh, but the, the, the fact that they're, they're saying we're doing a, 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 an overview of the premises to look for victims um, is hardly credible. Uh, if they limit that looking for victims to areas where they think they might find evidence. Uh, and at that point, uh, there's, there's no question but that the, the uh, circumstances of the investigative activity they were engaged in led them to look for evidence uh, behind the house. Nothing that they encountered initially uh, led them to, to look for evidence upstairs. But if they were legitimately looking for another victim, uh, there's no reason that they would not have, have gone upstairs. Uh, so in terms of consistency with their activity and behavior, 
the, in the early morning hours, uh, we would contend that all of this is, is truly consistent with the version that Phil Van Adder offered to the Fiato brothers and to, uh, uh, to Agent Wax, that OJ was our suspect from the beginning. Um, it is also consistent with the modus operandi described by Detective Mark Furman in terms of the way he goes about uh, police investigative activities. Uh, that a good policeman simply follows his instincts, uh, finds the evidence, uh, and then uh, makes up the explanation or the probable cause or whatever justification may be needed later. Uh, and we believe that Your Honor should consider together the newly discovered evidence with respect to Detective Furman's credibility along with this newly discovered evidence with respect to Detective Van Adder's uh, credibility. Now, I know that Your Honor previously ruled that the uh, newly discovered evidence regarding Detective Furman's uh, credibility uh, did not require a finding by the court that uh, Detective Furman was credible because it really made no difference. Um, his activity, uh, the court found, was corroborated uh, by the testimony of, of Detective Van Adder. Uh, but of course, Your Honor can't simply now reverse the process and say, well, we don't have to worry about Detective Van Adder's credibility because he was corroborated by Detective Furman. There's only two detectives uh, who testified in the course of this motion to suppress, uh, Detective Van Adder and Detective Furman. Uh, and we believe that uh, in the face of this evidence that seriously undermines the credibility of both of these officers, uh, the court is left with very little uh, in terms of believable justification uh, for the search activity that, uh, that went on uh, in, the, in the early morning hours. Uh, I, I don't believe Your Honor can simply dismiss the evidence undermining Detective Van Adder's credibility um, as BS. Uh, we're talking about two different incidents that occurred at two different uh, times uh, we're talking about three different witnesses who heard statements to the effect that uh, Mr. Simpson was a, a suspect from the beginning. Uh, in view of the importance attached to that revelation by Craig Fiato, uh, assuming that he had very important and very damaging information uh, to the prosecution in terms of the O.J. Simpson case that he would be motivated out of revenge because he felt he had been poorly treated or poorly used by the DAs uh, to make this revelation uh, suggests that it wasn't uh, regarded as simply BS uh, in the context in, in which he heard it. Uh, and of course, uh, I, th I think uh, what Your Honor really has to ask yourself is whether the BS came from the witness stand or whether the BS came over a beer in a, in a hotel room. I think all of the circumstances suggest that we may have heard more BS from the witness stand uh, than we heard in that hotel room. Uh, and finally, this information can't be dismissed as a joke. Now, I was trying to think of what uh, the joke would be uh, for the punchline, uh, OJ was a suspect from the beginning. Um, and I have to conclude that the only way you can explain that as a joke is that the joke was the Fourth Amendment. And I think we have to ask ourselves whether we can really be surprised if police officers treat the Fourth Amendment as a joke uh, if we don't take the Fourth Amendment seriously uh, in our courts. Uh, believing that four detectives left the scene of, of this brutal murder unattended and all went to Mr. Simpson's residence at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, simply to make a notification uh, that at that time Mr. Simpson was not a suspect 
uh, requires us to really suspend our, our credibility, our, our credulity. Um, and perhaps the only person in America who would still believe that that was the only purpose of their visit uh, would be a judge ruling on a motion to suppress. Um, if the police uh, can expect uh, when they come to court that the kind of testimony presented in this proceeding uh, will be taken seriously, the, the game of police perjury will continue. And the only way we're going to put that game or to a stop um, is to start to take the Fourth Amendment seriously, uh, to demand that when police uh, dispense with the Fourth Amendment requirement of a warrant and probable cause in order to engage in search activity, uh, they have to come to a court and get justification. Um, and they can't just make up the reasons afterwards uh, to present a plausible explanation. Uh, if, if we want to demand that kind of police conformity uh, with the Fourth Amendment, uh, then we've got to enforce the Fourth Amendment. People. Your Honor, once again, I've sat here and listened to um, the defense bluster and engage in a lot of rhetoric when it comes to the search and seizure issue. The, they've attempted to make this report the same points repeatedly with this court to no avail. Now, we have here, of course, some newly, it's not really newly discovered evidence. I don't even know if, um, frankly, uh, there's, well, I don't know how to characterize this since it's evidence that happened, if it happened, after the testimony at the motion to suppress. So it's, while it's newly discovered, it's also an after-the-fact evidence. Um, at any rate, let's, now what I, what I heard Mr. Yulman saying is that they were renewing their motion to suppress the entry onto Rockingham, and that's all they're doing. So I'll address just that focus. And that, of course, was the hearing that was initially heard by the magistrate in municipal court, and which this court has had two occasions now to have to reconsider if that would be affected by anything newly discovered by the defense. Uh, the most recent being whether the Furman tapes would have affected that magistrate's ruling. The court did not have to reach that issue. Now, there's a couple of reminders I want to make. First of all is that the Bishop Court, Bishop case, which is cited within my last response to their last motion to renew based on the Furman tapes, is that that court is the one that construes the newly uh, discovered evidence as applied to a motion to suppress made below. And it cautions the Superior Court, which is, acts as the reviewing court in this instance, um, that the court should look to new trial motions in determining the standard. And we know from my cited Wicken to the court previously, and we know from the Bishop case itself, that the appellate courts consider um, evidence, newly discovered impeachment evidence, as evidence which tends to imp impress weakly, because it doesn't go to the heart of what was testified to, but it's only calling one of the witnesses a liar and something that witness testified to indirectly, rather than directly, by direct proof of something other than what the witness testified to. So we do start off uh, from the basis that we have many times within this trial on a collateral matter, and that is um, whether indeed there is any... Um, I don't know that I consider a statement that is in direct contravention to testimony as being collateral. All right, and, and uh, you know, as I was saying issue. that, as I was saying that, I was thinking I have a, a reason for saying that, Your Honor. It's a it's a inconsistent statement of the witness who testified. So in that sense, well, it still is collateral. But the the main reason I say that, Your Honor, and the point I want to make early on in, in talking to you about this motion, is that the state of the law now, then, and for quite uh, for a few years now, is that. The subjective intentions of a police officer, whether it be uh, to arrest someone, to detain someone, or to enter a residence in exigent, exigent circumstances, is not controlling anymore. That was pre-Proposition 8 law, and there's one case in particular I'd like to cite to the court because it's a 1995 case, People versus Hull, H-U-L-L, -L, at 34 Calap 4. Sorry, 34 Calop 4th, 1448. And in that um, particular case, which was 1995, as I mentioned, the defense argued in that case that the court had to determine whether the 
uh, officer's entry into a residence was both objectively and subjectively reasonable uh, before it could uh, decide the search and seizure issue or whether the entry was appropriate under it, exigent circumstances. And the Court of Appeal directly held no. That was old law. That was pre-Prop 8 law. You know, we have Prop 8 and Lance W. Remember all those cases, which I know you've heard countless uh, suppression motions with regard to. Subjective intent of an officer no longer controls. And it doesn't, frankly, even have any relevance in the instant situation because all of the circumstances known to the officers warranted what they did. And the, what I'm pointing out is, is the most obvious thing. I won't save it to last, but in addition to the newly discovered uh, testimony of the Fiato brothers and Agent Wax yesterday, the court has heard from Commander Bushy, who said he ordered these detectives to go over to the house. So regardless of whether Detective Van Adder may have considered uh, Simpson a suspect in his own mind, that's not why he went there. And even if that's why he went there, it does not matter, Your Honor, because the law says you look at the objective facts and what would be objectively reasonable for an officer to do, and not what was in any particular officer's state of mind. And that whole course makes that plain and clear in rejecting a defense argument to the contrary. And it upheld the exigent search in that case. 1448, page. 1448. It may still be in the advance sheets rather than a bound volume, but it's final. I, I, uh, somebody double-checked for me with the Court of Appeals, still published and final, the remediators issued. Um, what, so division, what division is that from? It's, uh, it happened to be third district, Your Honor. But of course, any state Court of Appeal opinion is binding on any superior court. Indeed it is. <laughs> As you're well aware, I know. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just like to throw in when it happens to be second district, this one does not happen to be. Um, no, just, just, just a professional curiosity. Mm -hmm. So, Your Honor, here we have, um, we have a few things for the court to consider. We have whether, and the, the basic premise, remember, is for you to determine whether this, this evidence would have affected the ruling of the magistrate below. And I submit that when you look at this in conjunction with the state of the law, which is that the officer's subjective state of mind does not matter, and when you look at it, all of the newly discovered evidence, or the, the new evidence, I should say, including Commander Bushy's testimony, that they were ordered to go there to make notification. Um, it's clearly something of too little import to have a, a caused the magistrate below to grant the suppression motion. And that's basically what had to have happened. And if you recall, as I argued the other day, the Bishop Court indicates that mere relevance is not the standard in terms of whether it would have affected the ruling of the magistrate below. It has to be uh, more substantial evidence, something more substantial and something akin to what the new evidence would be on a new trial motion that could warrant a court granting a new trial and would, would likely to lead to a court granting a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. And as I pointed out the other day, as Witkin and Epstein uh, remind us, the um, for a court to grant a new trial um, based on a new witness on newly discovered evidence which goes only to credibility or impeachment is virtually unheard of. It's just simply not done because it is, it does, it is considered collateral. And so to go back to that, in terms of talking about collateral evidence, this evidence is collateral in the sense that his subjective state of mind didn't matter. Now, it ended, he ended up, Detective Van Adder ended up testifying extensively to that, but I submit, especially if you look at the correct standard that you have to apply, in determining um, whether their entry onto Rockingham was proper, he could have been a suspect. There would have been nothing wrong with Detective Van Adder feeling that he was a suspect if he had. I, the point is he didn't, but if he had, um, it is the ex-husband of, of uh, excuse me, the ex-wife of someone who was murdered. And, you know, that person, until you rule out people and can start to narrow it down, everyone is a suspect, so that anyone closely associated with that person is a suspect. So the point to all this is uh, not that his, his state of mind is critical in terms of the motion to suppress, but only um, that the defense has tried to uh, get the jury to disbelieve Detective Van Adder. And it's interesting in this regard that they are only now bringing a motion, a renewal of the motion to suppress. Um, I don't know if they watched the news last night and decided maybe they better do it for the record or something, but it's amazing to me that that was not their first line of attack, as it was, I believe, with the Furman tapes. Um, it's only today as a virtual afterthought, after the jury has heard all this evidence and they've gotten in front of the jury, that they decide, wait a minute, maybe we ought to ask for a motion to suppress as well. So um, I think their lack of timeliness, well, certainly the court, if it were inclined, could deny it as untimely, but I know this court acts conscientiously and wants to look at it. Well, no, what, actually what happened is during the course of the 1054.7 hearings where this, this information was first disclosed to the court by Mr. Hodgman and Mr. Yokelson, um, I discussed with Mr. Hodgman and Mr. Yokelson the likelihood 
that this renewed 1538.5 motion would be one of the obvious consequences of, of that disclosure uh, if the witnesses did, in fact, uh, after their interview, testify in the manner which they did yesterday. And when the disclosure was actually made to counsel, and my recollection, Ms. Lewis, is that you were not present during our chamber's conference uh, where these matters were actually turned over to the defense, that was one of the uh, suggestions that there would be a renewed 1538.5. So this is not something that, that comes as a surprise well, to me that this is here. Okay, so I think we've all been on notice that this is coming. Well, it's not a surprise uh, because, and we expected it, and I even wrote a brief in anticipation of it, which uh, I don't believe the court needs to address additional matter, which, which hasn't been renewed. But um, the fact that we expected it, it doesn't mean we weren't, in fact, we were surprised the opposite. That just actually drives home my point, Your Honor. I don't know if the defense, I don't believe, because I haven't been told so, that the defense ever raised it before today is something that they wanted to do, even though we all expected it, because we just had that good experience with the Furman-McKinney tapes. So we, we all knew, and certainly the defense knew, having just brought the motion on the McKinney-Furman tapes, um, that they had the right to do this. And it, that's why I'm surprised that they didn't do it sooner, or didn't give notice sooner, or didn't make an issue of it sooner. So I don't think this, um, let me put it this way. I want, I believe the record supports the court denying it as untimely. Uh, however, I know you to be a conscientious judge who likes to um, not have to not to use that as a ground. So that's why I'm going on to talk about these other things. But it certainly doesn't appear to be timely. Just because we expected it uh, doesn't make it timely. I mean, a lot of counsel forego doing things as tactical matter matters, um, you know, that are expected, and that they end up not doing as tactical matters. And this could have been one of those situations, particularly where they may have felt that the gamble was worth it to see if they could have your honor hear have the jury hear it without. Um, risking the jury not hearing it by you're limiting it only to a motion to renew and the motion to suppress. Uh, in other words, so that they wouldn't have the evidence considered for two purposes. Maybe they f were afraid you'd split the baby or something and not let them put it in front of the jury if we had it in a motion to suppress. So there are certainly tactical re reasons supported by the record why they could have decided not to bring one. And here now that they've had their cake and, cake and eaten it too, and in terms of the jury hearing all this stuff, they have nothing to lose at this point by now bringing up this motion at this last late hour after you've already ruled in their favor with regard to all those witnesses, both Fiato brothers and Agent Wax, who testified yesterday. So they have nothing to lose whatsoever now, but I submit their initial um, lack of notification was a tactical decision on their part not to bring it earlier when they should have timely brought it. Um, in addition, there are, there are additional cases besides the Hull case, Your Honor, that's simply the most recent and is certainly the most on um, point in terms of being an exigent circumstances case where the officer is forced entry onto a home. Um, Mr. Yeoman makes the repeated point um, about the officer's actions once they entered onto the premises. That also uh, reminds me of something, if, if I recollect correctly, and I think I do because I reviewed this recently, Detective Van Adder's testimony um, was that once they had been at the premises, for something like 45 minutes, they had contacted West Tech. They knew the defendant, West Tech had no knowledge of the defendant being out of town. They saw a light on, I forget if it was upstairs or downstairs, but some light in the interior of the residence. I think they saw a light on outside, and I can hear Mr. Cochran real loudly, if, if you wouldn't mind just cutting it down a little bit. So um, thank you. So they saw, they saw a light on in the residence. I believe it was upstairs, but anyway, it was inside the residence. They rang at the bell. They couldn't rouse anyone. West Tech said they had no knowledge of him being out of town. And that's, I believe, when Detector, Detective Fer, um, Van Adder indicated he did become concerned for the lives and welfare of the defendant who was in there. So that, that flowed naturally. So they did have additional reason, besides Commander Bushy ordering them to notify him for the reasons Commander Bushy articulated uh, eloquently in court. Um, they did have good reason to go onto the premises and try to find him. And their actions, once they entered the premises, were consistent with trying to find Mr. Simpson. They went up to the front door and knocked on it and got no response. They went to the first guest house, the first guest room down there, and knocked on Cato's door. He didn't tell them Simpson wasn't home. He didn't, he didn't know, or he didn't say anything at that point in time. I guess he knew because he'd helped him pack off. But he didn't, the, the state of the record is that he did not say anything at that point in time to these officers. So they went on to Arnell's room while uh, Detective Furman appropriately stayed behind to, to see if there was anything um, suspicious about this man who, uh, who looks like Cato looks um, in the defendant's guest house, considering the murders that had just uh, transpired. Excuse me. He picked up his clothing. He asked, are these the shoes you wore last night? Totally consistent with wondering if he might have been the murderer to look and see if there's blood or dirt in the bottom of those shoes. 
Um, and then, you know, the rest is history in terms of Cato describing the thumps and him going to do that. But the other three detectives, all the three D3s, uh, went ahead for their primary purpose or, and their, their purpose, period, to find the defendant. And that's when Arnell um, initially said, isn't he home? Something like that. And sh so she wasn't aware. It's also about that time, I think, that either Arnell said the maid was off this weekend or it was after they first, she let them inside the main house that they looked and saw the, the uh, maid's room, which was downstairs, where the bed was made and it was clear the maid wasn't working that night so they didn't have to worry about her safety and run upstairs for her. And then they got a hold of Kathy Randa. Kathy Randa told them the defendant had gone to Chicago. Um, and they got a hold of him there. So all of everything they did was consistent with a search for Mr. Simpson. And for the defense to reiterate about four detectives going to the Rockingham for these purposes, Your Honor just heard Commander Bushy say it's, it's not unusual at all in this situation. You have two kids at a police station that one of them may have to do something to take care of. You have the, a grieving family that they indicated it may be appropriate for a detective or officer to stay with until a clergy person arrives. There may be other witnesses to be interviewed. There's a lot of potential things that could happen. So to have four detectives uh, go to the home when it's O.J. Simpson, um, and the police are being especially circumspect to do everything because they know they're going to be uh, subject to higher uh, scrutiny than perhaps they should be, and, and they have been indeed throughout this case. Um, and I'm not saying higher than they should be, but higher than they, they normally are, certainly. Uh, they were subject to higher, heightened scrutiny. And it went on and on and on, it has gone on and on and on. Here we are again, right at the end of the evidence in the case, arguing the same stuff again with regard to their actions but their actions were proper. Certainly, if only two detectives had gone and there had been a need for emergency help, they would have been highly criticized for not having additional uh, detectives available to handle it. Um, so there, the, all of the uh, uh, actions and conduct of these detectives when they um, arrived there and the reasons for going over, arriving, all of them were perfectly circumspect. Detective uh, Furman would have been um, um, negligent in his duties as a police officer not to investigate the noises that um, Cato described on the wall, and he did what was appropriate in that situation. The officers, the detectives in this case, acted appropriately throughout all of those uh, circumstances and that timing. And if Detective Van Adder was uh, tired and getting <laughs> up in years when it came time to writing the affidavit, he may have made some errors, and the court has already found those. But I don't think the um, affidavit that he made when he was tired after being called up in the middle of the night when the detective uh, was called in the middle of the night, the affidavit he had to get out quickly for purposes of a search warrant that day. I don't think you ought to consider his credibility in that light. I think you ought to look at the testimony yesterday and the testimony of Detective Van Adder of the eight days he was on the jury, on the witness stand. The court had a lot of opportunity to observe him and listen to him and decide uh, for yourself if you find it necessary to decide um, whether he was credible. And all of that was after the court had to rule on the um, the search warrant affidavit. So certainly the search warrant affidavit is something they're not re-raising that in terms of uh, uh, Fourth Amendment issues. So I don't think that's what the court should look to in terms of deciding that indeed this newly brought motion to suppress should be denied. Uh, four brief points, Your Honor. First, uh, with respect to the timing of this motion, um, I don't think it can be seriously argued that uh, this motion is not timely uh, being made uh, Counsel, within uh, a week of the... Don't waste uh, any okay. time on that. Our, our concern was that the court not have to hear the testimony twice. It was obviously relevant for the jury to hear, and now we're asking that the, uh, the, the, the same evidence uh, be incorporated into the motion. Point two is the testimony that we have asked the court to now consider as newly discovered evidence uh, is the testimony of Detective Van Adder, the Fiato brothers, and Special Agent Wax. I did not mention Commander Bushy, and the reason I did not mention him, him is specifically because his evidence is not newly discovered. Commander Bushy was available to the people at the time the uh, motion was heard before the uh, magistrate. Uh, there is no basis uh, for the people to offer Commander Bushy now as a newly discovered evidence that was not uh, previously available to the court. Uh, but in any event, uh, we would remind the court that uh, there was no testimony by either Detective Van Adder or Detective Furman uh, that they were responding to any order from Commander Bushy. In fact, uh, Commander Bushy was never mentioned 
uh, by either Detective Van Adder or Detective Furman in the course of their testimony uh, on the motion to suppress. So uh, we would contend that uh, uh, even though he is not newly discovered, uh, Commander Bushy is uh, for any purpose of, of this motion irrelevant. Uh, third point, the issue uh, presented here is not the subjective belief of the officer versus the uh, objective uh, uh, belief of the officer. The issue here is the credibility of the officer. The, uh, the, the question here is whether we should believe these officers in terms of the circumstances that they have um, outlined as giving rise to their reasonable belief that uh, they needed to make an immediate entry uh, and that their purpose in making that entry uh, was to look for victims or to make a notification as opposed to being engaged in a search, uh, either for a suspect or for evidence uh, of a crime. Uh, and when you, when you boil it all down, uh, what we have here uh, on this motion to suppress are two police officers, Detective Van Adder and Detective Furman. Uh, and on the evidence now before the court, the court, uh, with the newly discovered evidence, must make a new finding with respect to their credibility. This court is no longer bound by the finding with respect to the credibility of these officers that was made by the magistrate. And with the evidence that is now before your honor, uh, the evidence of the Furman tapes in terms of uh, Detective Furman's approach to the investigation of, of uh, criminal activity uh, and his propensity to simply create uh, a reasonable explanation after the events have, have taken place. Uh, the evidence of Detective uh, Furman's perjury in the testimony in this trial. Uh, the evidence with respect to Detective Van Adder's uh, misrepresentations uh, in the affidavit uh, that this court uh, found justified a conclusion of a reckless disregard for the truth. And now the impeachment, the direct impeachment uh, of Detective Van Adder by three witnesses uh, who testify that he indicated O.J. Simpson was a suspect uh, from the beginning. Uh, this court is simply left with a record uh, of two liars, and two liars cannot corroborate each other. Thank you, counsel. All right, we'll take our uh, mid-afternoon recess at the moment. I'll read the whole case and come back and give you my ruling. Yes, uh, just as a matter of, uh, of um, calendaring and how we proceed after that, um, will the court consider taking Mr. Sheck's uh, the the people's request for judicial notice uh, when we come back? I'd as, like to do as the next resolve issue? the Sims issue next. Oh yeah, that will that will involve uh, Mr. Sheck also Sims, and then those two issues that resolves him, so he can then uh, be finished. And but I guess I wanted to know, depending on what you rule on that, there'll be a question of whether the jury will be brought in tomorrow. I'm sorry. There's a question of whether the jury will be brought in tomorrow. That is correct. There? So we need to hear that. Which All is right. why I'd like to resolve that. Okay, next. let's resolve those two things. Or yes. Those two. Thank you. All right. The jury is not present. Uh, with regard to the renewal of the 1538.5, I think, uh, there you are, Mr. Allman is correct that the, uh, the court's evaluation is that of the witnesses who have testified in support of the motion at the preliminary hearing, and therefore the testimony offered by the prosecution of Commander Bushy uh, is not admissible at a renewed 1538.5. And so the record should reflect that in making these determinations, the court has not considered uh, Commander Bushy's testimony since the prosecution may only recall uh, witnesses who testified in the original motion. Having said that, the court has evaluated the testimony of Agent Wax, uh, Craig and Lawrence Fiato, and also evaluated the circumstances uh, 
that uh, circumstances and context that surround those discussions. And the court, in noting the context, that is drinking beer in a uh, hotel room and standing around smoking on the smoking deck on the 18th floor, strike the court as being relatively informal uh, circumstances. And the context leads the court to believe that the comments, if in fact made by Van Adder, and I believe they were, um, I don't find significant weight can be placed upon them. In evaluating what impact that has on the credibility of Detective Van Adder for these purposes, I find that it does not have significant or overriding impact that would cause this court to reevaluate the original finding. The conduct outside of the Rockingham residence, when viewed objectively, uh, does not indicate a uh, search for the defendant uh, to arrest him or to otherwise uh, invade his uh, home. The officers stayed outside the residence for a considerable period of time. Uh, they attempted to get a response from the residents inside and were unable to do so. Rather than at that time uh, breaking and entering, they sought assistance from the West Tech Alarm Company. Uh, the West Tech Alarm Company responded. The information that they gave to the officers um, raised the uh, concerns uh, even more. The indication being is that there was no information that the defendant was out of town or should have been out of town and that there should have been a uh, housekeeper on the premises at the time who should have been in a position to respond to the uh, knocking and ringing by the police officers. Um, the prosecution is correct that the standard cited in Hull uh, by Justice Nicholson is the standard that is applied to cases subsequent to the imposition of Proposition 8, so the court's previous ruling stands. All right, let's move on to the Henry Lee notes and whether the defense should be allowed to recall Mr. Sims. Mr. Sheck, do you want to address that issue? I'd rest on the arguments. I think that... Uh, right. I just wanted, uh, if you could, uh, a, a word of interpretation on Dr. Lee's notes then. What I have before me, and this is defense discovery pages 764 through 770, and on the um, just if you just tell me which date is this the February or the April now? This is the April second. Right. And am I correct in assuming that otolidine tests were done on the B sock and that results positive results were noted inside the on the inner surface on the B sock that it, it appears to me that in some areas that's true there are a number of uh, areas on that sock yeah All right, Mr. Sheck, do you have any, any other explanation as to why the court should allow the recalling of Mr. Sims in light of it? It appears that the defense had possession of the sock at Mr. Taylor's uh, facility in Altadena, uh, which is, you know, a local community here. That it, The previous complaint was that at the LAPD that uh, Dr. Lee was not given a professional welcome and was not accorded appropriate equipment, but it appears that at Mr. Taylor's facility, uh, Dr. Lee and, and uh, Professor McDonald had uh, free access to the sock, were able to test it, examine it microscopically, to take photographs, to do testing. And is there a reason why we should go beyond at this point? No, I think I stated the reasons before. Uh, if the court wants to hear them again. Uh, 
Well, in light of what I see here, can you tell well, me? I don't think this makes any difference. Uh, I mean, assume, let's just, there were early notations by Mr. Sims uh, as to what he saw in November. He was the first person that saw the socks in their pristine form. Then in July, he and uh, Dr. DeForest make additional examinations in light of what the defense witnesses said about the ASOC. They then come up with information that corroborates the fact that there's a wet transfer uh, from surface one, surface two, to surface three on the BSOC. Now, let's uh, posit, and I don't think these notes are definitive of anything, but let's just posit that our experts missed it and their experts found it. If it's sculpatory, it's exculpatory. People? And forgive me for re-asking, Mr. Sheck, but you know, I have a lot of other issues I've had to contemplate. So oh. when I ask to revisit an issue, oh, I, I'm no. not. No, 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 Your right. Honor, I, 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 I was trying to, I was trying to be succinct. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Clark. I don't think I understand Mr. Sheck's argument, but first of all, the diagrams make it clear that Mr. Lee saw the rel made the relevant observations back in April at Mark Taylor's laboratory. That's what the, the otolidine tests are all about. That's why you have the diagrams and the number of pages devoted to SOC B with, a, I think it lists um, positive, negative, positive, negative, showing an entire list of testing stains that he did. So they obviously knew about it. Um, back in April. Obviously, they chose for reasons they're most aware of. Perhaps they thought that the sake uh, stain was more probative um, and they could elicit better expert testimony about it. In calling, let me see if I can frame this. Tactically, sp tactically speaking, Your Honor, what they do in calling only Gary Sims is attempt to put the issue in front of, they have the testimony of Mr. McDonald. Assume hypothetically, Your Honor, that Mr. McDonald looked at SOC B and said, I'm not going to be able to give you your planting theory on this one. It just doesn't look right. There's only a couple of yarns where there's an indicated transfer. You can't say it's transferred from, sta from the surface two. It could be transfer as a result of Mr. Simpson's bloody finger, and I just can't give you what you want on that. So what they do is they call Gary Sims to testify to the few yarns that seem to be, um, that give a positive result with the presumptive test, his observation of those couple of yarns, and leave it at that, hinging the inference on Mr. McDonald's previous testimony. And that way, they get all the inferences they want and all the implications they want without ever having to be shown up for the fact that they cannot link it up with Mr. McDonald's testimony. It will then be up to the people to set the record straight. Number one, that the surface three stain cannot, or can't call it a stain really, so tiny, but what they see on surface three cannot be necessarily be attributed to transfer from surface two. Number two, that if there were planting, you'd see far more than a couple of yarns transferred. Number three, that it could easily have been transferred by a bloody finger. Or number four, that it could have been the result of phenolphthalein tests. Or number five, from the way the socks were laying, uh, the toe folded up on the ankle in one, uh, in one photograph, I think it showed. But let me ask you this, Ms. Clark. One of the things that concern me is, well, let me tell you two things that concern me. One, actually three things. Okay. One, uh, these notes from Dr. DeForest were turned over relatively recently, at least the ones that were held back for 1054.7 purposes, which I then ordered disclosed. Uh, which was within the last week or 10 days. Secondly, um, Gary Sims was the prosecution's witness who gave, testified to the uh, wet transfer stains on SOC A and did so, I thought, in an, a uh, very uh, concise way. I don't remember him testifying. Thirdly, during the course of our discussions, when we had Mr. Sims back here, the defense did ask for permission to retake him as a defense witness to go into the areas that they wanted to go into. At that time, I told them that I would likely allow that. Then you objected, or I think it was Mr. Darden actually who objected, 
and indicated, no, if they want to take him as their own witness, let them call him in their case. So I said, okay, with that representation, I hate to drag Mr. Sims back, but I did tell him I would allow Sims to be recalled. So I'm kind of in a situation where, because of the objection, we've got to drag him back. Well, you, you know, Your Honor, I disagree. The one thing that we did not get to litigate... And I, and I might add that I think tactically they believe that Sims is a good, believable witness before this jury. Oh, I don't... Fine. And, that for him, and for him to say that there's evidence of wet transfer, that's tactically great for them. Well, number one thing, I do not recall him ever testifying that there was evidence of wet transfer on SOC A. I remember him discussing the powder um, that he saw on surface three, but I don't recall him saying it was a wet transfer. All right, Mr. And Sheck, uh, excuse me just a second. Mr. Sheck, do you have Dr. DeForest notes, the ones where it does discuss the wet transfer? Yeah, I don't think Ms. Clark is disagreeing that Dr. DeForest's notes say no. wet transfer. I think what she's saying is that previously Mr. Sims had offered testimony which allows her to argue that the stain on sock A is not a wet transfer but is flaking from fibrils right. that arose from the cutting. Right. That's precisely why you're in trouble on sock B because he says something different. Well, right. no, I, you know, I've talked to Mr. Sims. We're not in trouble. Excuse me. Uh, but nevertheless, the problem that I have with a defense posture of saying we can recall him in our case in chief is the court did not give us an opportunity to be heard with respect to whether it was an appropriate thing to do. The court is aware, this is an unusual posture to be in, but the court is aware that at the time we presented Gary Sims, we were in our rebuttal case. The defense had rested their case, subject to Whitehurst only. They sought no provision for Gary Sims or any other witness. And the people specifically requested of the court that the conditional resting be not permitted to expand the defense case out into the outer realms of the universe just because they had not formally rested. Otherwise, we can go on forever. I mean, we can just keep calling people. So can the people. Correct. You know, this has got to end somewhere. But Let me see counsel without the court order, please.
All right, thank you, Council. Is the matter submitted? All right, I will uh, allow the reopening for Mr. Sims. I'll direct Council to uh, call uh, Mr. Sims uh, this evening or later this afternoon, uh, re interview him with regards to this one particular issue, and uh, make a tactical determination whether or not you still want to present that. All right. Okay, uh, exhibits, Mr. Douglas. Uh, was the next thing be that judicial notice motion for Mr. Sheckman? Okay. That way I can go find Judicial notice. Actually, Your Honor, I don't think you I, I know we're not ready, and I've been told the defense is not ready on exhibits this afternoon. Um, we, Mr. I Douglas, how many exhibits are there? Your Honor, the, there are 130 or so of the people's exhibits that they have sought to introduce since <laughs> we began our case on July the 10th. And then there's the question of those exhibits that the defense has offered since we last had that issue a few weeks ago. So how many total do we have? Approximately 160. All right, Ms. Lewis, when are you going to be ready to do that? Actually, I won't be arguing, so I'll defer to Ms. Clark as her best estimate is when we'll be ready to uh, handle our exhibits. I assume we're going to do this the same way, that we'll sit down informally decide which ones we're going to fight about. We're going to be doing jury instructions tomorrow, right? I was hoping to do it today, but it looks like we're not going to make it. Yeah. Um, during the course of jury instructions, uh, we have people preparing on this right now. So, like, maybe after the meeting The problem is there's a lot of you and there's only one of me. On the exhibits? Exhibits and instructions. Well, you've got 42 special instructions offered, so. Yeah, some, I think some are going to be more hard fought than others. It's going to be hard to do with them. I, we can be prepared. We have to go through all of these exhibits. Um, I think the ones that I have highlighted here are the ones that Mr. Brother is objecting to. That was 42 from the defense. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's hear the uh, let's hear the motion for judicial notice, and then we'll launch into the see how far we get on the other matters. All right. I know we don't have the defense objections to our exhibits, and I think that we have completed almost completed the defense exhibits the last go out that we did. How many? Just about. Uh, how many remaining defense exhibits have we not litigated? Okay, what? Let's do the judicial notice issue now, and then we'll take a break, and I'll take you and Mr. Douglas back in the chambers, and we'll schedule this. All right. I'm sorry? Thirteen. Only thirteen. We need the defense objections to ours. They only have thirteen. That's pretty easy to handle. We need to know what they object to in our exhibits before we can... Okay. Well, we can do this informally. All right. Mr. Sheck. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Lewis, you're the proponent of the request for uh, judicial Actually, notice. Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg. I knew I'd get it right sooner or later. Good afternoon. Uh, we're asking for judicial notice, Your Honor, in relationship to several questions in four areas that were propounded to Dr. Lee. I don't know whether the court had an opportunity to read our request for judicial notice. It's yes. actually fairly brief and succinct. Uh, and I hope states our position rather clearly, but I'd just like to emphasize the, the key points for Your Honor, because I know that you've been covering a lot, as the court has previously pointed out in the last few days. There, there are four areas that we're complaining of. The gravamen of all of them is that in each one of these instances, there were a series of questions that were asked Dr. Lee that had the clear and unmistakable uh, effect of conveying to the jury the overall impression that the prosecution somehow unilaterally determines when and under what circumstances the defense can have access to evidence as opposed to the court making those kinds of determinations or at least having a substantial role in making those determinations. And also uh, these questions were couched in language and the testimony was couched in language which elicited testimony to the effect that 
that Dr. Lee was prohibited or denied access or wasn't allowed access to the evidence until certain dates. The first such instance, Your Honor, is uh, in relationship to the inspection of the socks, and the court will recall that there was fairly extensive testimony by Dr. Lee about how he felt he was treated at LAPD and the extent of the time that he had to look at the socks only being 20 minutes. I think he testified, even though in actuality I think he had more, but he, he implied that it was only 20 minutes. In reality, the Sox had returned from the Department of Justice on November the 22nd of 1994, and there was no application to this court to look at the Sox between November the 22nd and February the 16th. And clearly, the defense could have done it before February the 16th. I think it was the defense that decided to do this at the very last moment before it was sent to the Department of Justice. So, so this is a wrongful impression that has been created in front of the jury. The second item was that the defense asked a, a number of questions about the Bronco that were couched in terms of acting Dr. Lee. When were you first allowed to visit the, the, the Bronco? Or were you, when were you first permitted to uh, look at the Bronco? And words of that kind. They used that sort of language on a number of occasions. On some of the occasions, we objected and object objections were sustained. But this was one of those instances where we felt that the answers to the questions still left the impression that somehow it was the people that were, that were not permitting uh, Mr. Lee to, to, to look at the Bronco. And again, this is an area where the defense never made any application for this court or complained to this court about Dr. Lee's access to the Bronco. The third area was in relationship to the inspection of the, the Bundy crime scene where Dr. Lee said that he was ordered by someone, I don't know who, we weren't able to confirm this one way or the other, that he could only be at the crime scene for 20 minutes. However, he never made any application to this court, nor was any complaint ever lodged with this court. Actually, what happened is, is I believe that prior to the time I came on the case, there was an informal agreement or maybe a formal agreement between the parties that the people would have reasonable access to the Rockingham location for certain inspections and that the defense would also have reasonable access to Bundy. But the unmistakable impression was left in front of this jury that the only access the defense had was this 20 minutes and they were ordered that they could only be there for 20 minutes and they were prohibited from doing the kind of testing that Dr. Lee would have liked to have done. And then the fourth item that was uh, testified to by Dr. Lee is he stated that Mr. Shapiro had told him that the only photographs that they had received from the Los Angeles Police Department in terms of crime scene photographs were second or third generation photographs. Uh, as the court knows, both from your experience as a prosecutor and also as a judge, we always provide in discovery original photographs from negatives, which was done in this case and is done in all cases. In fact, I don't even know if we, we have the capacity to routinely provide anything other than that in terms of a photo shooting photographs and then providing second or third generation copies. So the jury has been left with the impression that we gave the defense less than satisfactory evidence. That is clearly not true, and we believe that that, that misimpression should be rectified. Therefore, we are asking that the court take judicial notice as the people have requested in our application for judicial notice as to these four items. What the court is being asked to do is to take judicial notice of the law of the state of California uh, in terms of discovery obligations and inform the jury that the, that the people do not get to unilaterally make these kinds of decisions, that applications can be made in front of the court. That is mandatory under the, the, the uh, code of evidence. And then we are also asking the court to take judicial notice of the court's own files that certain applications or orders were not sought for these four specific items of evidence. And that is permissive that the court can take judicial notice of that under the California Rules of Evidence. So we would respectfully request that the court take judicial notice of these items in order to correct these misimpressions in front of the jury. Thank you, counsel. Your Honor, this reminds me of that scene in one of my favorite legal movies. Uh, uh, I think it's my cousin Vinny. 
where uh, the defense lawyer gets up and says, everything that man just said, and I'll just, uh, after the Fiato brothers, it's incorrect, both on the facts and the law. I actually had to go up and look at all the page references here uh, that they filed, and I'm concerned about Mr. Goldberg's page references. He says, the defense, wrong, the, the defense also implied the defense was wrongly denied access uh, to inspect the Bronco. Now, the questions were, uh, at the bottom of page 43022, uh, Dr. Lee, before I move on to the next series of boards, I'd like to ask you, ask you briefly some questions about the Bronco. Did you have an opportunity to personally inspect, examine, and look at the Bronco? No. Could you do a reconstruction of the Bronco? I cannot do a reconstruction because I do not have a direct examination observation of the original condition. Uh, that was, it was perfectly clear that he was going to give very limited testimony just from photographs, and he was explaining when you can do a reconstruction and when you can't, and if you don't have, you don't look at it, you can't do it. He was only explaining the limitations of his testimony. Now, with respect to uh, the examination of the socks on February 16th, uh, Mr. Goldberg is again in error with respect to the motions that went back and forth on access to this evidence. And I don't believe that he was yet active in this case and doesn't have the same recollection of this that I think you and I do. And that was that there was extensive and extraordinary litigation about access to the biological evidence in this case and when we could do testing and when we could do anything more than simply examining or looking at it and even then under what conditions and circumstances. And the fact of the matter was that the socks were under examination and in prosecution took the position that they weren't finished testing until Mr. Sims's report was out, and that was in January. Now, unbeknownst to us, if they had actually sent the socks back at some point uh, to the LAPD, unbeknownst to us, it wasn't clear to us that they had finished testing because they were sending them back and moving them back and forth and they hadn't finished their DNA testing. And as the court distinctly recalls, when we finally, after weeks of negotiation, had uh, reached a plan to send physical evidence to Albany, and Dr. Lee's testimony was completely accurate as to what the terms and conditions of those orders, that order was, in terms of being able to look at it and examine it. When we had done that, this whole issue of EDTA testing arose. That is, that the prosecution said, we want to do EDTA testing on certain designated items of evidence, in particular the socks. And of course, the socks were the items of evidence that we wanted an opportunity to examine uh, firsthand and do testing on the most. And uh, in your chambers, with Mr. Yokelson and Mr. Hodgman present, I turned to the court and said, well, if we get Dr. Lee down here from that conference in Seattle, can we have an opportunity to look at the socks? And what followed is 100% accurate in terms of Dr. Lee's testimony as to when the, 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 ter the terms were, that they a courier were, was flying out. They were about to be packaged off, up and sent off. And sent out, and we, were sat, we sat there waiting, and you can bring Mr. Hodgman and Mr. Yuckelson down there, and they'll tell you that every syllable that Dr. Lee uttered about what those facts and circumstances were were true. And as far as what went on in the evidence processing room, I was a witness, and I know what I saw. Now, Dr. Lee testified. Uh, to what happened there, and those are, the fa those are the circumstances that they put together in terms of his inspection of the evidence. Those are the boards that Mr. Harmon chose to put in. That was the testimony they chose to elicit from Mr. Yamauchi. Dr. Lee expressed himself clearly about what he thought of it. They got to live with it. They did it. Uh, as far as access to the crime scene is concerned, uh, Mr. Uh, Goldberg indicates that he is in no position uh, to give a factual refutation as to what the terms and conditions were of Dr. Lee's inspection of the Bundy crime scene. The record is very clear that Mr. Shapiro had sent letters to the police department and had made uh, requests to the prosecution and the people at the crime lab for Dr. Lee and Dr. Baden to have access to the evidence as they were testing it. Ms. Kessler made very clear that that would not be permitted. That was not their policy. They were going to get to deal with it when they wanted to, how they wanted to, and uh, we've had a lot of litigation about access to the evidence. Uh, and those were the terms and conditions. He wanted to get the crime scene as soon as possible. 
Their argument in closing is going to be that some of the observations he made there that day uh, uh, should be ignored by the jury because some other unknown people might have left imprints on the walkway. And we have to live with that, but our access to that crime scene was limited, and they have to live with what they did with it. Those are the facts. He has said nothing here that in any way contradicts uh, the facts as Dr. Lee stated them. Uh, then there was uh, the whole issue of the photographs. I actually looked every one of these quotes up. And uh, at 42895, all Dr. Lee has said, these are three pictures given by Attorney Shapiro. At 43241 to 43242, um, it's Mr. Goldberg, as I understand, asks if the picture on our board is a photo of a photo. And it was made clear that we had small original photos given to them, and then we blew them up as photos or a photo. That's all that's there. He asked that question. Uh, the, then there is testimony on 43276 to 43277, where Mr. Goldberg shows the new and much better pictures that Agent Bodziak testified were prepared in August for purposes of confronting Dr. Lee in the witness stand. And Dr. Lee said, don't have picture as good as this. And then he indicated that even this picture, which was an overall picture of the walkway, was taken at an angle, and it was selective in that it was focused on the Bruno Magli prints and not in any other prints. And that's what he said. Uh, then he was asked uh, something to the effect of, well, um, didn't you ask for better quality prints? And he said, I asked Mr. Shapiro, he says that's all he had. Now, that raises the one issue which I think, frankly, is the genesis for this whole motion, which, as I'll get on to in a second, has no basis in law whatsoever. But I'm just concerned even about the facts here. And that is, there is a significant motion pending before this court with respect to the contact sheets. Because I'm sure the court's recollection of this is pretty clear. And that is, we were asking for these contact sheets from day one. And they're going to have to listen in closing argument to the testimony of Mr. Rokar and what we were finally able to do when we got those contact sheets. Now, the record is indeed uh, somewhat ambiguous. Mr. Hodgman can't recall whether or not we asked him for negatives. A court's recollection uh, may govern on this, because I think some of these requests were actually made in your presence. It's Mr. Neufeld's recollection and my recollection. We did ask for negatives as well as contact sheets. But the point was they were in the exclusive control of the prosecution. And nobody disputes that we asked for contact sheets all the way through and didn't get them. Uh, and the contact sheets reveal an extraordinarily important fact about when that picture was taken of Mark Furman pointing to the glove. Very important fact in this case. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We seem to be on to a different motion. We're all no. shaking our heads here. No. The point is that that motion is pending, and I'm saying as directly as I can, I think this motion is frivolous, and it's done because the court has put that under submission, is going to give that contact sheet motion serious thought, and uh, uh, Factually, none of these things even state what they say. He never talked about wrongful denial. He just stated the facts as they were. The citations they make here don't support their position. Now, as for their legal position, their legal position is bereft of one case citation. And that's for very good reason, because it is a complete uh, uh, misunderstanding of what one can do with respect to judicial notice. They are not asking for judicial notice of a statute um, or some public record or fact or anything that's laid out in 451. What they're actually asking for is that judicial notice be taken that if the defense filed a motion or that the, if the defense they want uh, the fact that if the defense filed a motion for certain kinds of relief, then the court would have granted it. That's essentially what they're asking for in each of their uh, uh, requests. And it's inappropriate unless, it's inappropriate, period. And what it would really require is for the court to take judicial notice and summarize every single discovery request that was first given to the prosecution and rejected, and all the different motions that went into the litigation of access to the evidence in this case, which was fiercely litigated, including the court's decision 
that they could continue testing all the way through the case and withhold access to certain evidence. Uh, I've tried to look back at that file, and it's numbing. And it seems to me uh, wholly inappropriate for this kind of uh, judicial notice to be taken for which there is no citation whatsoever um, that uh, one can take judicial notice about court orders that were not requested, not note the ones that are relevant on point that did make requests, including informal requests to them as we're directed to do by the discovery sections. Um, and it is totally uh, uh, not called for in light of the testimony that they cite here. So this application is wholly without merit on the facts and the law, and I submit to the court is really just a uh, make weight uh, because they're worried about something else that the court still has under submission. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, uh, if that's the first time I think I've heard my cousin Vinny cited as legal authority in a court of law, what counsel perhaps doesn't know is I, I believe that that citation was overruled in the more recent movie of A Few Good Men. Um, Your Honor, what we have is a uh, situation here where counsel, through his clever phraseology and asking of questions, I don't think it's Dr. Lee's fault, create certain impressions in front of a jury, which are obvious to anyone that is listening to what is going on, obvious to this jury, which are untrue. And the issue is, does the prosecution get an opportunity to show that it's untrue? Yes, we can. And we can do that by offering evidence. And we could have offered evidence. Or we can do that in other ways that are permissible under the California Evidence Code. That is judicial notice. And when the court is either required to take judicial notice or may take judicial notice, that is an appropriate avenue to take to counter evidence that was offered and impressions that were created in front of this jury. I've already tried to state the factual basis for the record and perhaps would invite the court to look at this again. Because it's not just a question of reading the literal language and the very careful phraseology that Mr. Sheck used, but a, a, a question of the court evaluating the overall impression that it created and whether it wrongfully created an impression that should be remedied and that should be set straight, that the people are entitled to set straight. Just very briefly, Your Honor, to give the court an idea of this overall uh, statement that I'm making that in general misleading information was put before the jury. On 42900, Mr. Sheck asks, all right, now Dr. Lee, you mentioned before, before that arrangements were made so that the defense ex experts for the first time could actually examine items of evidence in this case at Albany Med Medical Center on February the 17th and 18th and 19th, correct? It's not really a, a, a complete uh, sentence or thought, but what, what is clearly stated here is that the first time that they could actually examine items of evidence was on February the 17th, 18th, and 19th, that they didn't have any ability and weren't allowed to examine evidence before then. Similarly, on the very next page, 42901, Mr. Sheck asks, were you able to you or other defense experts, to your knowledge, were you given an opportunity to actually examine physical evidence by touching it, microscopic examination, prior to the shipment of that evidence to Albany on February the 17th, 1995? And he said, yes. So again, it's making it sound like we did not give them the opportunity. Well, they didn't ask. They didn't make an order, an application for this court when the socks had been returned on November 22nd, I believe Mr. Harmon sent a letter to say that, they, that they, these socks are back. Between November the 22nd and February the 17th, they could have asked to see the socks, and they didn't. But they have been led to believe, the jurors, that we did not allow them to unilaterally. said, no, you can't see these. The court didn't have anything to do with it. We just said, you can't see them, and they didn't get a chance to see them before February the 17th. It's a misimpression. On 43.030, in relationship to the Bronco, uh, Mr. Sheck asked the following question on line 7. Couldn't get to see the Bronco itself 
answer, no. Then on line 15 by Mr. Sheck, did not see the Bronco itself? No, I did not. Well, what does couldn't get to see the Bronco mean? Uh, on 43022, he's asked the question by Mr. Sheck. Dr. Lee, before I move on to the next series of boards, I'd like to ask you briefly some questions about the Bronco. Did you have an opportunity to personally examine and look at the Bronco? Answer, no. So clearly, again, the unmistakable impression is being conveyed to the jury that somehow we did not give him the opportunity and he was denied access to the Bronco. Sorry. Mr. Cochran, are, are you finished? Yeah, I know, but it's a privileged conversation with your client, and I can hear what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then in relationship to the photos on 43276, uh, he's asked the following series of questions by me. Doctor, did you ever ask the defense to provide you with higher quality pictures? Answer. I get the information that's all the picture we get. It's total out of sequence, mixed up like a deck of card. I spend a lot of time trying to make some sense out. Question, but when you got it from Mr. Shapiro, did you say, please send me some examination quality photos? Answer, I did ask it. He said, that's all he get. He took it back right away. I don't have the photograph. Now, Mr. Sheck, when he read this exact quote, you said that Mr. Shapiro said, that's all he has. He didn't say that's all he has. He said, that's all he get. Well, who did he get it from? The people. So again, what is clearly being stated is that all we gave him were photographs that were not examination quality. Look, you know, I, I don't know why the defense does this. I don't know why they create misimpressions that are very easy to rectify, that are very easy to set straight either through, through evidence or through the provisions that are allowed by the California Evidence Code and then complain when we try to do it. But Mr. Sheck did this. Uh, the, the questions are obviously very, very carefully worded and carefully phrased. But I think now we should have the opportunity to set the record straight. And under California law, judicial notice is an appropriate way of doing it. We are simply asking the court to take judicial notice of what the law is. It's a correct statement of law that the court can decide when access can be granted and denied to evidence. And we are asking the court to take judicial notice of its own files, that such applications were not made. And we would ask the court to do so. All right. Thank you, Kevin. All right, under ordinary circumstances, uh, a request for a court to take judicial notice of certain facts, statutes, uh, one of the basic requirements is that A, either there be no reasonable dispute as to the fact or circumstance that the court is asked to take notice of, or that the facts are easily susceptible of determination. Uh, these discovery issues were hotly contested throughout this case. There remains controversy today. There's nothing that we agree upon here uh, between the sides. Uh, these are matters that could have or should have been resolved during the course of the examination of the witnesses in question. The request for judicial notice is denied. All right, scheduling of exhibits. You mentioned there's apparently an additional uh litigation that needs to happen. The court recalls the Gretchen Stockdale issue where we served her with a subpoena. She said, I gave them to the defense. We tried to get them from another source, and I believe the court was carbon copied on a declaration indicating the original source erased them in their normal course of business. Uh -huh. And apparently, thereafter, we asked the defense for them, and they apparently they, well, the note I have indicates that they, the defense destroyed it. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Do we anticipate litigating this? Because the indication I got from Ms. Clark is that both sides uh, subject to a final decision as to Mr. Sims were going to rest, so there's no point to going into Gretchen Stockdale unless somebody's going to call her as a witness. Well, this, this, mo this note has just uh, been sent down from Ms. Clark. Um, that was my understanding. And further, Mr. Mr. Shapiro, so you're not here. All right. Well, May, may I just indicate it's still on the plate since they're going to call Gary Sims and the court's allowing it. We haven't yet uh, decided not to litigate this. That's a note I just got from Ms. Clark, so I, apparently she wants to litigate it. 
the problem is that I don't want to, that the hour is late, but there'd have to be a reason. She just can't walk in and call Richard Stockdale. There has to be a reason to rebut something. And so that, that's what the law requires. And so they don't have that. They've said they've rested. The Gary Sims issue is something that came up before, but I'll ask you to take it up tomorrow when Shapiro's here, Your Honor, if we're going to deal with it at all. Yeah, Mr. Shapiro was the one who was handling that aspect of it. Okay, what we have left then are, is the motion for an instruction regarding the contact sheets, the instructions in general, and exhibits. Um, I think Mr. Hodgson is most familiar with the contact sheet issue. Is that something that has yet to be No, that's, that's just, no, that's under submission at this oh. point. But that was a request for a, an instruction, so that's part of our instruction discussion. Uh, who is going to handle the instruction discussions? The for the jury instructions for the case? Yes. Uh, I believe we anticipated handling that tomorrow because I'm, I'm maybe mistaken, but I think Mr. Kalberg's going to handle that for our side, and he teaches, I think. Okay. <coughs> All right. Are there any of the exhibit matters we can resolve this afternoon? Your Honor, court, please, I, um, Mr. Douglas, good have afternoon. the majority, although Mr. Sheck and Mr. Newfield have not yet given me their list, but we can begin perhaps with my identifying those exhibits to which there are objections uh, and start the process in that manner. All I right, why don't we do this then? At this point, um, I would suggest then that... Uh, Ms. Clark designated me in her absence if you wanted to do it informally in chambers. Yeah, I was about to say, why don't we, why don't we just take a recess and formally go over the... We'll have uh, Mrs. Uh, Robertson gather up the exhibits that have been introduced after this certain date. Uh, we'll just take them one at a time, and then we'll litigate after we pare it down to the ones we have to fight over, and then we'll uh, take care of those. There's, there's an additional motion pending. Did Mr. Uh, Your Honor, just the uh, Henry Lee notes discovery violation motion. The court had ruled that there was a discovery violation in the late disclosure of certain notes related to Dr. Lee, but the court had not imposed any sanction asked the people to file a statement of what the prejudice was, which we did on September the 11th of 95. That would the court have the opportunity to read that. Uh, I have that to, need to be. something that had slipped my mind for a while lately. I know Mr. Goldberg expended considerable time and effort in detailing the prejudice that we suffered uh, for the court's instruction, so. All right, we'll take that up during the course of our instructions then. One more percent, Your Honor, that I think. Uh, one thing, Your Honor, that I was going to say, I was just talking to Mr. Sheck about it, so some of us may take our leave, but if in the event, how long will the court expect to be here? In the event that Mr. Sheck speaks with Gary Sims and there's some resolution one way or the other, we'd like to let you know this afternoon. It might have I will something be to do. in the courthouse at least until 530. All right. And as you know, Mrs. Robertson can always get in touch with me. All right. We, we may try to let you know something by that. Yeah, time. I would appreciate I that. I think that's yeah, appropriate, that's Your Honor. All right, then what we'll do is we'll stand and uh, let me ask you this. Uh, Ms. Lewis, do you know when Mr. Kelberg would be available? In Sorry. the... Uh, How early tomorrow morning he would be available? Well, Dean Ullman, are you available as early as 8? Uh, Mr. Kelberg gets up beyond uh, my wildest dreams and ungodly hours of the morning as is his normal schedule. I do need to make a phone call, Mr. Yeah. Hodgman, make sure that, that was a designa designated person. I don't think it's Kelberg. When he left this time, he said he wasn't coming back anymore. I think he meant He's promised that before. <laughs> he said that. Mr. Ullman, are you available at 8? I'm available if the court's convenience. All right. Uh, why don't you check and see if Mr. Kelberg is available. We'll start our informal um, jury instruction conference then at 8 tomorrow morning. I'd like to get this done tomorrow because I'd like to instruct Friday. All right. We'll take a recess. I'll have Mrs. Robertson summon up the items, and then we'll have an informal conference on the uh, exhibits. Anything else? Always afraid to ask.